welcome to Dorchester Community Church. It's fantastic to have you with us on this lovely, sunny spring morning. The psalmist says, hear my cry, O God, listen to my prayer. From the ends of the earth I call to you. I call as my heart grows faint. Lead me to a rock that is higher than I. You know, I guess the question to those of us that believe in God is, if there is a God, does he listen to me? Is he interested in me? Is he interested in the little things that worry someone like me? And if he does listen, and if he is interested in us, then I guess the question is, what ought we to be saying to God? And that is what we're going to be thinking about this morning. If you've been coming over the last few weeks and months, you'll know that we're looking at Matthew's Gospel. And in particular, over the last few weeks, we've been looking at this thing that we call the Sermon on the Mount. And it's really a picture of what we as Christians ought to look like. How should we behave? What should we be doing and how should we be doing it? And I guess this morning we come down to the crux of what being a Christian is all about. You know, being a Christian isn't about following a set of rules. It's not about signing up to this religion or that religion or going to this church or that church. At the end of the day, it's about a relationship. It's about a friendship. It's about children coming before their father. And what sort of relationship exists without communication. You know, if I never spoke to my wife, it would be a pretty unusual kind of marriage, wouldn't it? If my wife never spoke to me, it would be a pretty unusual kind of marriage. It's all right, because she's usually got plenty to say. (laughs) (laughs) But you know, that is the reality, isn't it? So many of us live the Christian life And we don't talk to the person that that life is centered around. And yet when we do, we tap into a power source that is greater than anything we can possibly imagine. And this morning, Jack is going to be unpacking a bit of what it means to come before our Heavenly Father and say, Abba Father, Daddy. I call to you from the ends of the earth, from the place I'm in, although I feel distant from you, although I feel in a mess, I'm going to cry out to you and know that you will listen. And you know what? We're going to do that just now as Ali leads us in worship. Good morning, everyone. We're going to sing um, a song now that needs some participation again, obviously. Um, So there are tambourines at the front. Um, so if anyone would like a tambourine, then please get one. And um, Leo is going to show you where you're meant to be hitting the beat. But I would also say that this morning, um, I keep getting the words wrong in the songs, I think, as Lainey has pointed out. So please don't worry Like if, you're, if you get the words mixed up or you like hit the tambourine in, in a place that doesn't seem like the right place. It doesn't matter. So like this morning, we just want to come before the Lord and you know, use our words and join in and worship um, however we want to. So this is Blessing and Honour, Ancient of Days. Please stand if you're able.
Thank you, Ali. Please take your seats. On the programme, Ali emailed me. It just says, David, Ancient of Days. <laughs> One of the things that um, we love to do as a church is to celebrate the good stuff that God does in our lives. You know, we're people that believe in a God who can change our lives and who can change our circumstances. And uh, we believe that God is interested in changing big stuff and little stuff, and he gives us stuff to celebrate. And one of the things we love to do as a church is to celebrate and to celebrate with chocolate. So if you've got something to celebrate this morning, be it a big thing or a small thing, perhaps a wedding anniversary or a birthday or an answer to prayer, put your hand up, share it with your church family, and you can have a chocolate too. Right, there's some hands went straight up at the back here. Jake, what would you like to celebrate? Got my new watch. You got a new watch. That's excellent. You're going to hold it. AM. And it talks as well. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> right, Zach, what would you like to celebrate? I got a medal at my inter club at Taekwondo today. <laughs> right. That's amazing. If if you ask Zach afterwards, he'll show it to you, but make sure you ask him nicely. <laughs> There you are. Well done, Zach. Alison, what would you like to celebrate? Have you been to Taekwondo as well? Uh, no, only to take him there. David and I celebrated our 15th wedding anniversary last Tuesday. Wednesday. Fantastic. Many congratulations. <laughs> right. Bethany, what would you like to celebrate? We went to Longleat on Tuesday. We did, didn't we? And they didn't keep you in the monkey cage, did they? Right, Shirley, what would you like to celebrate? We celebrated my father-in-law's 99th birthday yesterday. Wow, wow that's amazing. Yeah. Wonderful, gentle man and a godly man. We love him. That's where Ian gets it from them. <laughs> Absolutely. Right, anything else to celebrate? Marie... Um, I'd just like to thank God for an answer to prayer because um, our son and his wife and children have been in Thailand for a few weeks and they came, they were due to come back on Monday, um, <clears throat> but their daughter was taken ill on the flight from Bangkok to Dubai and they ended up in a medical unit in Abu Dhabi, which was all very worrying and frightening for everyone. Um, they missed their connecting flight back to Heathrow. So... Um, but we had everybody praying. She had a very high temperature and other stuff going on. Um, but anyway, after 24 hours, she was declared fit to fly and their airline managed to get them on another flight and they got back on Wednesday. So we were so grateful. That, but we would appreciate prayers because she's still quite unwell. So, yeah. It's... Fantastic. Thank you, Marie. Thank you, everyone. Big stuff, small stuff, and at the centre of it all is a God who loves to do good things for his children. Just a couple of things I want to mention. Um, we've been going to be thinking about prayer this morning. We've got a prayer meeting here at six o'clock tonight, as we always do. If you'd like to um, come along, that would be fantastic. We'll be praying into what God is saying to us as a church and how God wants us to reach out to the community as a church. Um, on the 19th, what day is that, Jack? Uh, Friday. Friday the 19th, we're going to have a prayer walk. If you like walking and praying, that's the thing for you to come to. From 10.30 to 12, um, bring a packed lunch as well. Um, that's an opportunity for us to walk around our immediate community um, and pray for it. Um, and part of the reason we're doing that is because we've got an Alpha course coming up starting in a few weeks' time. Um, so be thinking about who you might invite to the Alpha course. You know, we've talked about the Christian faith the, being all about relationships. 
And, you know, God gives us relationships so that we have people we can reach out to. Start thinking about the friends and your neighbours and your perhaps members of your family that you might be wanting to invite on the Alpha course. If you want to be able to come along and help on the Alpha course, we're going to be having a meeting on the 19th. Just a short meeting from six till seven, um, and Jack's going to be talking about the different ways that you can get involved and help on the Alpha course. Um, the Alpha Supper is going to be on Thursday the 25th. If you don't know what the Alpha course is, the Alpha course is a very short, um, I think it's 12-week course, exploring what the Christian faith is all about. What does it really mean to be a Christian? What's this God thing that we keep talking about? What's the Bible all about? And it's not as you get in church where you have it told to you from the front. This is an opportunity for people to come along and ask any question they like and for it to be discussed. Um, Fantastic opportunity. Many, many millions of people have been on the Alpha course and have discovered new life in Christ. And that is what we're all about as a church. So um, team meeting here on the 19th, if you want to explore how perhaps you can get involved in Alpha or the Alpha Supper will be here on the 25th. If I missed anything out, Jack? No, no? good, right. <laughs> right, um, now the children are going to leave us and go out to Community Kids and we're going to sing our next song and take up our offering. stand again if you're able. Good morning, everybody. Um, It's our time of prayer, so let's come to the Father. Our Father who art in heaven, we magnify and lift up your glorious name this morning. Almighty God, 
We thank you that through the blood of Jesus that ransomed us, we can boldly approach your throne and come as we are in prayer to you, any time, anywhere, and in all circumstances. We are in awe and so grateful that we can communicate directly with you through prayer. We pray that your kingdom will come, Jesus. We eagerly await your return and thank you. The Spirit and the Church, your bride, say come. Let your will be done in our lives, Lord. We praise you as if we are already in glory and celebrate the gift of everlasting life and the freedom we can have in Jesus Christ. Today we ask you, Father, for our daily bread, that you would please nourish and strengthen us, that we would have the things we need to do your work that you have set aside for us. We pray for our spiritual needs also. Search us, Holy Spirit. You know our heart's desires and what we need before we have asked for it. May what you give and supply us be according to your will for us. We pray for our brothers and sisters who are unwell and cannot be with us in fellowship today. Bless them with healing and your peace and comfort. Forgive us our sins and help us to resist sin and behavior that is not pleasing to your eyes. Guide us, Holy Spirit, to enter into prayer immediately when faced with temptation. We choose to forgive those who have done us wrong because you forgave us. We pray for our enemies, those who stand against us. We pray that you, Lord, will soften their hearts and that they can encounter you. Continue to help us to be slow to anger and quick to forgive. You have called and commanded us to love one another as you have loved us. We plead the protection of the blood of Jesus over all aspects of our lives, against evil, and that all the plans of the enemy to harm us will be cancelled in the mighty name of Jesus. You, Lord, gave us all the power, and you give us everything that we need this morning. And you have all the power, Lord, and we give you all the glory. Everything exists because of you. There is no greater God than you. We thank you that we can be your children. Draw us close. You are everything forever and ever. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Thank you, Charlene. Right, as I get my stuff ready, just invite you to turn to your next door neighbour, say hello. If you're new, say welcome to the church. Give you have two minutes while I set up, so just feel free to have a chat. Can everybody hear me? Are we all good? We're good to go. Great, right. Let's make sure I'm standing in the right place. Right. As we've been saying, we're carrying on uh, on our series through Matthew, and we come to the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, we've been going through it for some time. And, you know, as I was going through this this week, I was reminded of different things, you know, and I was always thinking of the Sermon on the Mount. It's often about the attitudes of what it's like to be a citizen of, of heaven. And what, it's, what that really involves, you know, this is, God is saying, you know, this is, you want to be my disciple, you want to be my follower. Okay, these are your attitudes and this is how you are to act. And sometimes I think we can look at it and we can kind of think of it as a set of rules and, and set of standards that we have to reach. And almost that we have to revise these different things, not to be angry, not to be this, not to be that. And it almost becomes something that is a burdensome in some kind of way. And as I was doing it, I was reminded that when um, my wife is from South Africa, if you're new and you don't know her, Candice, and when she came to England, after two years, she had to do a life in the UK test in order to be a citizen, well, she's not a citizen yet, but in order to be part of the United Kingdom. And she had to revise for it. And I thought, you know, so she was doing it for a while when she said to me, you know, Jack, uh, I find this quite difficult, this life in the UK test. I said, guys, 
don't worry, I'll come forward. So it was all arrogancy of a 25, 26-year-old I was. I said, here I go. I am a professional Englishman. I can settle the score. Hold back and I will teach you how to do it. So anyway, and then I came and I found out some questions. And I put four questions down I'm going to present to you today. I'm probably going to embarrass myself if all of you know these questions, the answers. But here we go. Here's just, a, here's just about four questions, the genuine questions that they ask. So, I'll just show of hands at the end, or you can shout out. When Queen Anne died, a German, George of Hanover, became the next King of England. Is that true or false? Hands up for true. What? <laughs> hands up for false. Huh? It's true. See, oh, we're not doing too good so far, are we? Let's go for the second one. During the reigns of Elizabeth I and James I, the English government asked the Scottish and English Protestants to settle in which Irish province? Pale, Grimsby, Ulster or Dublin? Hey, any thoughts? Ulster, yeah, I thought you might know there. Brilliant. We've got one British person here anyway, at least. Third one. What is this? This one I haven't written down the answer for because I don't know and I can be bothered to write down the whole list. What is the difference between the House of Lords and the House of Commons? Nothing. Nothing. <laughs> I'll leave that for the recording. I'm not going to get involved in that. Uh, one last one. This was a really funny one. When, when I got to her, I thought, when I was, remember going through, and this was a genuine question she received. What year did the Romans invade Britain? I mean, who knows that? Yeah, there you go, Ian. <laughs> And yeah, these are the questions that they were asked in order to become a citizen or in order to kind of understand to be part of the UK. And I thought, well, I've been part of the UK for 26 years at that time. And I couldn't answer a single question, hardly, unless it was, you know, whose birthday is it on the 25th of December? It was, that was kind of as, hard, as far as my sort of understanding went. And, uh, you know, I was going through this. I thought, all too often we come and we think, what is it? that makes us part of a citizen of a country or part of a citizen of a kingdom of heaven. And that is what we learn about in the Sermon on the Mount. And that is what we get, we've been coming to grips with. And that is what is the essence of what we've been trying to fully understand. What it means, what are the attitudes, what the beatitudes. What are the things that we are meant to do as children of God within the kingdom of heaven? And, and we come to this section on prayer and this is a monumental section. It's, it's such a powerful section. In fact, you could probably do a series just on, on the Lord's Prayer itself. But you know, I was reminded when I went to at Spring Harvest this week, and they said that, you know what, things that we learn as children are often the things that we end up, when we, when we die, they're the things that we often remember. In fact, they say you often, there's a study that shows that when you die, you often remember, believe the same things you did when you were 13 years old. Isn't that an incredible thing to think about? Especially when we think about our children and our youth and what they're learning right now. And yet I remember as prayer growing up. In fact, I'll tell you a story. When I was a kid, um, you're old enough here, so it's, I don't have to sort of, so I'm addressing a younger audience. But I remember when mobile phones weren't around and you, when you went round to your friend's house, you had to call your mum up or your dad up and you had to say, look, I'm not going to be back for dinner. I'm, I'm at someone else's house. I'll be back at six o'clock, and I remember being at my mate's house, Tom, and I remember being in his room with his mum and dad there, it was hilarious, and I remember um, sitting down, and they said, can I, can I use your phone to call my parents and say that I'm not going to be back for dinner, because they've invited me there. So they said, yeah, sure, Jack. So anyway, I had the phone, and they passed me the phone, and I, and I said, oh, hi, and my mum and my dad don't answer the phone, because they never answer their phone, ever, they just use answer machine for everything. <coughs> So I left a message from my mum and my dad, and that whilst my, parent, well, my friend's parents were standing looking at me, and it went something along the lines of this. Hi, mum. Hi, dad. I won't be back for, for dinner. I'm at Tom's house. His mum and dad's invited me over for, uh, for food. I'm having a great time. I'll let you know when I'm going to come home. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs> and I remember my friends looking at me like, what on earth is he saying? Uh, I thought, oh gosh, can't rush home and delete that from the answer machine, can I? And these, you know, and I thought, but it was, it was so ingrained in me as a child to remember prayer. 
and to think about prayer, that it sort of rolled off the tongue. In Jesus' name, amen. Even leaving a phone message for my parents. And I think, isn't that such a meaningful thing in a, in a sense when we think of it for ourselves, when we think how much does prayer roll off our tongue? How much pr- does prayer really take root in our lives as we come to God and as we come before him day by day by day? So we're going to take a quick glance at this monumental piece of scripture and we're going to come to grips with certain bits of it and certain bits we're going to have to be left maybe home groups if you're own personal study but we're going to do what we can within the time that we have so we're going from <coughs> verse 5 chapter 6 verse 5 it should be up on the screen if you haven't if you like a bible please ask and we'll get one to you and when you pray do not be like the hypocrites For they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their rewards in full. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door, pray to your father who is unseen. Then your father who sees what is done in secret will will reward you. And when you pray, do not keep on babbling like pagans, for they think they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask him. This, then, is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this today our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive those, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For if you forgive the people that they, when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray before we go into this morning. Heavenly Father, we thank you that we get to come here this morning. We thank you that we get to come before your word. And we ask, Lord, that you would make this alive to us. For some of us who are new to the faith and for some of us who are veterans in the faith, that you would make this alive to us. The whole idea and the privilege and the amazing thing that we have that we can call prayer, that it would be something that would be so alive to our life this this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So, so many of us, if not all of us here, may be probably familiar with that, uh, the Lord's Prayer. And it kind of reminds me, uh, bear with me, I know I'm a, I often go off on a bit of a strange tangent, but I like to think I somehow pull it back again a bit. You know, uh, a bit like Star Wars. You know, like, I don't really like Star Wars so much until I was older. But if you grew up watching Star Wars, you probably remember watching the originals, The Return of the Jedi, all this kind of stuff. But then further on in time, you get the prequels, don't you, that came before it. And often what we remember is the main bulk, the main three, but actually the ones that came before it are just as important, if not more important, in some way, because they build the foundation for what's leading before. And in a sense, when we learn about the Lord's Prayer, that's kind of like the main movie, if you like, but there's actually a prequel to it that needs to be understood in order to fully grasp the Lord's Prayer. And that's what we're going to do today. You could look as if you like playing football. It's a game of two halves. You've got one half and you've got the second half. And we're going to tackle both this morning in the best possible way we can. We want to tackle first, first from verse 5 to 8. And we're going to sort of, just, I guess you could label it the basis of prayer. What is the foundation for prayer? And let's read it again. When you pray, do not be like the hypocrites. For they love to pray standing in the synagogues. And on the street corners to be seen by others, truly I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door, pray to your Father who is unseen. Then your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not keep on babbling like pagans, for they think they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you ask before him. So the first point we can see is that prayer is personal. Prayer for the Christian is personal. We're going to keep touching upon this theme. And I, I say it all the time when I'm up here, but you know what? I don't care because I love saying it. 
Christianity that makes Christianity so distinct from anything else and any other religions is that we have a personal relationship with our God. And it's not because of something we have done, but it's because of something God has done. It's not that we can perform in any way that we become accepted. It's God saying, now you are accepted. This is how you are to act. But the world would say, in order to be accepted, this is how you are to perform. And at the beginning, we hear this point where, where Jesus is saying, you know, there's people on the street corners, they're shouting out, they're getting all the praise and glory and all of that they need by screaming out their prayers. So others may see how holy they are. And in a sense, it continues on from what was said before, from the last weeks that we had, when Alan came up here and spoke about oaths. And she's saying, you know what, when you want to pray, go to your room, close the door. And pray to your Heavenly Father. Prayer is personal. Some of us today, when we think about, probably, we have, hopefully, many of us here have friends we can go to in Christ to pray for us. But also, likewise, there's probably many prayers that you pray, just you alone, in your room. Maybe with your spouse. And you just sat there between you and God. And those are your deepest moments where you just overflow all your anguish and all of your thoughts towards God. And what does God say in here? That your prayers are answered. That your tears are counted. That everything that you give towards God in private is not in vain. Perhaps that's for somebody here this morning. Perhaps when you pray at home and you know what you're saying, look, I don't even know how to pray, God, but I just don't know what to do. Life is going difficult. Things are going so wrong for me or things aren't going the way I planned. And God just wants to say, you know, I hear what you're saying. I hear your prayers. Prayer is personal. The next part we can say is, how do we approach God? How do we approach him? In this passage, we see that Jesus mentions, may the pagans pray. And often when we think about pagans, we think about irreligious people, skeptics. And I guess, you know, in some ways, that's how I would describe pagans, perhaps, in today. But if you think about when Jesus is saying this, he said, even the pagans pray, and they babble, their words go on and on and on. In fact, what Jesus is saying is, you know, the pagans pray too. In fact, pray, they might even pray more than what you do. And they go on and on and on. And they babble when they babble when they babble. But they think they will be heard because of their many words. And Jesus here, and in the words, what Jesus is saying is there's two different ways to approach God. There's the pagan way and there's the Christian way. There's the, or to put it like even better, what the most dividing line, if you could say, in humanity is not the religious from the irreligious, but it's actually the religious from Christians. Because one says, my father, and one says, my God, or they base it all on performance. One is personal and the others are not. And we come this morning just to briefly go through what this really means for us. The two different ways of approaching God. And the key towards this is how will you be heard? It says in that, but in the last line of that, they will be heard for their many prayers. So the key to unlocking this, I guess you could say, is this. What is the cause for which you will be heard? Is it because of your many words? Or is it because of how you approach God? We're not talking about eloquence and words and things like that. We're talking about your heart and your whole demeanor as you come before God. To understand the first we can say the true basis of prayer, understanding, and get a seven and eight. There are two different ways of coming to God. And you know, you can think about this, there's two different ways when you come to approach anybody for any kind of interaction, isn't there? And I know there are certain variations within this, so you're going to have to bear with me. But I think in general, we could look at it like this. There's two different ways you can kind of come before someone. You can come before someone, possibly in London, and you, know, you could say, you know what, well, I can come before and I could ask someone for directions. 
Or if, in my experience, if you go to London, they'll never even tell you that. They'll just walk right past you. But you can ask someone for directions when you're in London, or you can ask when you're in Weymouth or Dorchester. Why? Because the basis for your relationship, the basis for your interaction with them is rather small. So you can ask for a small exchange. You couldn't go up to someone in the streets and say, you know what, can I have your backpack off your shoulder? Because that's asking too much and your basis for your relationship is too small. If you want to have a greater exchange, then you have to have a greater basis for your relationship. You have to have a deeper interaction. And you could put this in another way. You could say, you know what? There's, not only there's two ways of approaching people, you could say there's a business relationship and a family relationship. And, you know, and, I was, and I like this analogy really well. I thought this is actually really good. And again, I know there are sorts of areas that you could kind of, well, you could kind of go off on a bit. But in general, there are two relationships that you have with people. They're either business or they're family. And business would be like when you say to someone, for instance, if you're, if you're living in someone's house, like maybe as a tenant. And as long as you follow certain rules and regulations, then the, then the landlord owes you certain favours and you do them certain favours and your relationship is kind of on key and it's kind of okay. But it's based on performance, isn't it? And in a certain degree... Dare I say, sometimes even friendships can be like that. Oh, that's a bit deep. (laughs) Sometimes friendships can be like that. We like to think that maybe they're not, and hopefully they shouldn't be. But sometimes friendships can be like, as long as I'm getting something, then I'm okay. And as long as they're getting something from me, then that's okay. Then that forms the basis of our relationship. And that's a business relationship, we can see. So you can live as a tenant, maybe, in, in a landlord. Or you could live in your parents' home. And you could be a son and daughter. Uh, if you're anything like me, the thought of going back and moving with your parents just like boggles your mind. You'll never in a million years would I do that. But, you know, you could be in, a, you could be in the presence. You can live with your mum and your dad. And you can live with your parents. And, the, and your relationship with them is so much more different. One is... What can I do? What can I do for you and what can I can get in return? One is conditional, the other is unconditional. One is about performance, and the other is just about being who you are. One is about doing, and one is about being. Or to put it in another way, which I really love. If you live with your parents and you're your child, you could say, since you are accepted, you should perform. Since you are accepted in this house, you should do certain things. Whereas the world or the business says, in order to be accepted, you need to perform. And these are two ways that we can approach God. Sometimes, and we're going to look into a minute, sometimes when we approach God, we can see, how do I approach God? Is it with, in the sense that I am his son and he or his daughter, or is it in the sense that I'm living as a tenant and I want God to do things my way? And if they're not going the way I want it to go, then I'm going to throw my toys out of the pram and I'm going to be unhappy. And then what Jesus does is he said, there's many ways to find out how you approach God. There's many ways to decide how all this happens. And Jesus just uses this idea of prayer as just an example. So this is how you, in other words, Jesus was saying, this is how you ought to know whether you're a pagan or Christian. When your prayers aren't answered, will you be cold and, or anxious? Will you be, oh, I've, been, I've paid the rent. I've done everything you've asked for, Lord. Why isn't this happening? Is that how you feel sometimes when we pray? I'll be, I'll be honest with you, just taking a side note from this. <laughs> when I was planning this and preparing it, I thought, you know what, sometimes I can filter into this way of thinking and it's not healthy. God, I've done what you asked me to do. I thought you would ask me to do this particular thing. Why haven't you kept your end of the bargain? But my attitude is one that is actually, you know what, I am a tenant expecting God to do something by performing for him. But actually, that's not what the Bible says. 
And God calls us and says, you know what? Since you are a child of God, I will bless you and I'm here for you. And sometimes God does withhold things from us, absolutely. So a religious person might say, God, come into my life. (coughs) You do your part and I'll do mine. But a Christian would say, God, come into my life. Be my father. I am not worthy of your favour, but Jesus lived the life I should have lived and died the death that I should have died. And in light of that, would you be my father? So the question I ask you this morning, one of them is, what is your relationship to God in prayer? What is your prayer life like? Is it one where you struggle to pray? That's fine. Is it one where you're, you're kind of, you're thinking, you know what, God, I've asked for things, but I haven't received anything. I'm doing mine at the bargain. Why are you doing yours? Do you know, I don't think God looks down and frowns on that. I think he understands that. But God will always say, just wait, child. It's okay. We have to release and say, you know what, we are not here to perform. And that is what sets Christianity, as I love saying it, from any other religion. That we are, as if you're a Christian here this morning, or you're thinking about who Jesus is, when you become a Christian, it's not that you have to perform in order to please God and to be a son and daughter. You're already his child. You're already his child. It's not a question of performance. It's a question of being. You will always be his child. But since you are accepted, now this is how you are to act. Since you are accepted, this is how you pray. When things are going tough and when things things are going hard, God is never far away. And that takes us on, I guess you could say, to the main bulk of the Lord's Prayer. Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. We're going to focus just on that one little line. (laughs) And everything else will follow, I promise. We We will finish on time. Do you know there's much consensus among scholars that when Jesus was saying the Lord's Prayer, he was saying in Arabic, he was saying Abba. And they translate his father. You know, and then in the Jewish, in the times when Jesus was around, there were several prayers that were going around known as the tefillah. And there were various prayers that were said and various beginnings of those prayers were stated and often they were said at the start and continuing forward. And there's a few. They start with, for instance, Holy One, Mighty One, Redeemer of Israel, Gracious One, or Our Father. And Jesus chooses our Father and only appears twice in all these prayers of the Jewish prayers. He takes this line and says, Our Father. In the Old Testament, Father is used a dozen times in connection with God. Sometimes as a simile, God is like a Father. And occasionally as a metaphor, God is our Father. But never as a direct address. There is a big difference. It is one thing to say you care for us like a father, which is simile, or you are our father, a metaphor. But to say good morning, father, is quite different. The first two are descriptions. The third is a title. In the Old Testament, father is used to describe what God is like. And Jesus now uses it as a title. And it's an amazing title in itself, isn't it? We can say, God is our Father. It is so much could be said about this thing, but I wanted just to hone in on just a couple of things. It makes it personal. Do you know what? It makes it personal. Jesus says, you know, no matter what is going through on in your life, God is a personal God, the God that we worship, the God that you come to and that you pray to. My God is our Father. 
And it isn't just for this group of people. It isn't just for this set time in history. It's for eternity past. It's for eternity future. That you know you will be a child of God and we can approach him as a child comes before their father. And in fact, as one of the scholars says, that even in some of the, near, in the Middle Eastern countries today, one of the first words that a child will say to their, when they speak is Abba. And it's a word that we bring and we come before God and we say, you know what? You are my father. And amongst all else, God, that is what I will say of you, first of all. Isn't that incredible? He could have said, he could have said several things. He could have said, my friends, Jesus, because God is our friend. He could have said, you are a creator. He could have called him our king. But no, he begins with our father. The two words that control your relationship these two words will, sorry, control your relationship with God. Understanding you are adopted as a child of God is the very essence of what it means to be a Christian. You came from death to life. You know, I, was, I once heard the story of, um, of tr- someone trying to uh, describe Christianity. And they said, you know, well, it's like a, a ship that has got loads of people on it and it's sinking, and then there's a rescue ship that comes alongside this ship, and then people come on board, and it takes them away. And the church, if you like, is like this rescue ship that takes everyone away. But you know what? I think that's, that won't cut it for me. <laughs> I, need, I, I think I want to do a bit better than that. Do you know what? It's actually more like this, I'd say. It's more like people are on a ship who are going through turbulent storms, and they try to save themselves, but they're unable to do so. So the best thing they can do is put on a life jacket and jump out and hope as it, as it sinks that they can save themselves, something will happen. And yet another ship comes across and finds someone with a life jacket on and they're not breathing. And yet they pull them into the boat and they push and they push and they push on CPR and they go and they go and they go and they go and they go. Because it says in the Bible, we have come from death to life. In Jesus, from death to life. That is what it really means to be a Christian. When we say our heavenly father, we see what he had done for us and sending Jesus for us. I love John 1, 12, and it says, Yet all who did receive him, yet to all those, sorry, yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Think about it. When you're, if you go through the process of adoption, it's nothing that the child does in terms of the adoption, is it? It's everything that the actual parents do. The child is still the same child. It's just their standing and their position is different. They are now with their adoptive parents. And God has adopted each one of us when we become Sons and daughters of him. And then it goes on to say, hallowed be your name. I'm just going to say one quick thing about this. We come to understand that God is our father, that he cares and that his concerns are for each and every single one of us. And yet, when we come before him, in a sense, you can kind of imagine the Jews at the time, they may have gotten bored with it to a certain degree, but they thought, how on earth, how on earth could it be that God who is in the heavens and who is so far away, how on earth could he be something that is so tangible and so real that actually I could reach out and he could be there for me in the midst of my struggles? He is so holy and so worthy and so righteous. And yet, how can I come before this heavenly God? It's this mix or this kind of confrontation, if you like, between love and justice, or love and holiness, rather. And you know, and there's a story, it's a true story. Um, in fact, it's in the Bible, so I invite you to read it. <laughs> it's in Hosea. It's one of my favorite books, the Old Testament. You know, in this book of Hosea, God calls Hosea to marry Gomer. Now, and it's, 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 it's understood that Gomer was. Um, a prostitute, or they, they sort of imply that, but we'll go along with that this morning. And he marries her, and he falls in love, and he gives her everything that he possibly could. 
He gives her all of his heart, all of his joy, all of his possessions. He gives into this marriage. God calls him to marry this particular woman. And, he has, and then they have a child together. And then she has two other children, but they're not his children. And then she leaves him with the kids. And then she goes off and does other things in the temple of Baal, maybe prostitution and other things. And he's absolutely heartbroken. And then when she comes and when she's there for a while, he later finds out that she's being sold. She's been, there's an amazing video of it, of, of someone's done an amazing video of it, where she's being sold into slavery because of her, what she's done. And, yet he, and then he comes before him and there's this mocking and this jeering. As you can imagine, oh, you can imagine this is your wife and she went away and she did this and she did that. And yet he comes before her and there's this real precious moment. If you read it, it's just the first three chapters of Hosea because the rest are really complicated. But if you read the first three chapters and he comes to this point and he buys her back. He purchases, he gives some money, he gives a sacrifice her back and she comes back and he holds her and he loves her and he brings her back to his house to restore their relationship. And in a sense, you can say that is what we can see here. Story, Hosea suffers the agony of rejected love in the process of something, God's divine agony, as he deals with the, as his wayward people. Hosea gets an idea of what God's love is like for his people, what God's love is like for us who have gone astray, who have gone away and done certain things, and yet he would do anything to bring us back. And yet we get the best picture, the best picture of this in Jesus. We get the best picture of this in the story of Jesus, who became sin for us, who went to the cross. You know, I saw this video, I keep bringing things up. I saw this video that I really loved. I think it was, I just, I think I saw it on YouTube or some other thing. And it's this guy and he gives this illustration and it puts it really well. And he puts it like this. It's like, you can imagine like Jesus is there and he's saying, and someone's, someone's coming up, Jesus here, and someone's speaking to him and he's saying, oh, hey, Jesus, uh, these are your disciples, these are your friends. Yes, okay, this is like, oh, that's great. Okay, I've got, to, I'm not going to give names because this is one thing that's always awful when you preach and you're pointing and you're just terrified you're going to see somebody's name. You say, Bob, you know, what's, what's, what's your thing? I say, oh, Bob, oh, I've got a problem with, um, I've got a problem with lustful eyes. Oh, okay, okay. Okay, Timothy, what have you got? Okay, yeah, I've got a problem with anger. Okay. Well, David, what have you got a problem with? I've got a problem with, I don't know, pornography. And Jesus, what have you got a problem with? Do you know what? I haven't, I'm, I'm sinless. I haven't got any sin. And then Jesus says, do you know what? What I'll do is, Timothy, I'll take yours. I'll put it on my chest. <coughs> you know what? I'll take yours over there. Your addiction to pornography, I'll take that. I'll put it on me. Do you know what? Your addiction and your, and your tendency to anger, you know what? They, I'll take that and I'll put it on me. And then they're all completely clean. And Jesus just has all these, these badges and these labels on him. And he takes it to the cross and he nails it to the cross. And then giving us the freedom to be the children of God. Isn't that the most amazing story that we can imagine? That we, when we were dead in our trespasses, that when we couldn't come before a holy God because of the things that go on in our lives, we can put it on. Jesus has taken every little thing that you've done and put it to the cross. It's just why? Why would he do that? It's only one reason, because God is holy and God is love. We worship a holy, holy God but we worship a God of justice and of love as well. You know, I'm going to end soon, so don't panic. I'm kind of descending, if you like, into my end of my summer. But you know what? I was thinking of this so much. And I was thinking, you know, we, when we pray, perhaps I'm going, to, I'm going to give a challenge to us today. Perhaps some of us enter into prayer too lightheartedly. So perhaps some of us enter into prayer where we're actually, you know, Heavenly Father and we, and we kind of like, it's just so easy. And there's nothing wrong in that. I'm just giving you a challenge here, so don't panic. 
But perhaps actually God is saying, you know what, that is great that you can step into my presence whenever you want. But you know what, you are stepping into the presence of a holy and righteous king. You are stepping into the presence of a holy one who who created the world, who created the universe and created you and I. And perhaps we need to just remember that when we worship in church and when we worship in our own homes and when we pray, We are entering into the courts of a king. Perhaps there's some of us here who it's the difference. It's the other way around. Perhaps some of you actually need to remember, you know what? I can remember that God is my father. That I can come before him and ask of anything that he would, that I need. It says in here, he knows what you're going to ask before you ask it. But you can come before him in prayer. And why are these things so pivotal in the Lord's Prayer? You say, Jack, you haven't even touched on the rest of it. (laughs) I would just probably answer like this. In fact, I'd probably ask the worship band to come up on stage, actually, as I come in to land, if you like. It's so pivotal because of this. Once we understand our relationship with God, once we understand that we are adopted as children of a father who loves us. It then follows that every other bit of the Lord's prayer can be answered and takes its place. What do I mean? I mean this. Our father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done. We're praying God's will on heaven that would come to earth. What's next? The petition, give us today our daily bread. We can only ask God for something when we realize who we are asking it from. Give us our daily bread. Forgive us our sins. We come into submission. Forgive us our sins as those who sin against us. We come to a place where we say, you know what, God? When I recognize you as my father, everything else will follow. I can pray for the needs that I have, whether it's the greatest need that's in my life right now, whether it's illness or sickness. I can pray for the needs of my friends and my family. I can pray for the needs of this world that need food and sustenance. I can pray that you would deliver me from evil. I can pray that you would deliver me along a line of life that you have in store for me. But I can pray this knowing that you are my father. I can pray this knowing that you are my father. And when we come and when we pray, this model that Jesus gives us is saying to us today that we can say, Abba, Father, I need you. And some of us here today, I think there's some things that we've been praying for that we haven't seen answers to prayer. And God is saying to you, you know what? It's okay. It's okay. I see your pain. I see your anguish. I am with you. I will not forsake you. Your status will never change. You are my child. Just ask for the the PowerPoint just to come up at the end. Just look at these pictures as we pray, as I just come to the thing I pray. You turn the lights down. The God of this world, who flung stars into space, is still the God that is with us this morning. What's on your mind and heart right now? Do you need to be reminded of who we come to to worship? That we have a spirit that cries out, Abba, Father. That amongst all these things he's created, yet you are his greatest masterpiece. And yet he wants to have a relationship with you.
Not because of what you've done. Not because you're anything special. Sorry. (laughs) But simply because he loves you. And we can cry, Abba, Father. I just invite you to close your eyes as we pray. Heavenly Father. Heavenly Father. (laughs) You are holy and righteous and beautiful. And we don't understand why you will love us so much, but yet you do. And we can't fathom that you have asked us to have a relationship with you that involves prayer, that we can come before you. And yet so many times, Father, we don't value prayer the way we should do. Forgive us, Father, for when we have neglected the power of prayer, and the necessity of prayer. Lord Jesus, I just pray for the congregation here this morning and those online. Lord, that you would help us to see you for who you are. That we would put you first. That we would want to see heaven come on earth as it is in heaven. I once heard someone say that the kingdom of God is is the realm of the unhindered spirit. And Lord, we want your spirit to be unhindered in this place, to move amongst us. And it all starts with prayer. So we give ourselves to you, Jesus. And we say, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who have sinned against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Yours is the kingdom, the power and the glory. For yours, Jesus, is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever and ever. Amen. Spirit of the
Um, yesterday was um, Cambodian New Year, um, Khmer New Year. And um, as we were singing that song, The Potter's Hands, I, I, I had an image in my mind of a game that's played in Cambodia at New Year. And it's like, um, you know, a children's piñata that you have at birthday parties where they hit it with a stick and the sweets come out. And actually what they do in Cambodia is they have pots, um, you know, like earthenware pots that are hanging from the ceiling. And again, you blindfold someone and they, you're meant to smash, smash the pot. And as, as we were singing that, the potter's hands, and I, was, I just had that image in my mind, and I was like, well, Lord, that's different, because um, this song is about being moulded into, into the shape that you want us to be. And then just as I, I prayed a bit more, um, and asking why I was seeing the picture of these broken pots, um, I just felt the Lord was saying, it's when the pots are broken, or the piñata is broken, that the, the treasure that's inside um, can be seen. Um, and, and so I, I feel strongly today that maybe someone here or maybe um, someone watching online is feeling completely broken where they're at and just doesn't know where God is in it or what God is doing. But I feel that what the Lord is saying is I'm revealing the treasure within and it's in that brokenness that, that I can bring that treasure out. Thank you, Tori, for sharing that with us. Thank you, Jack, for what you brought to us this morning as well. It's a big subject, prayer, isn't it? You good at praying? You're an expert at prayer? I'm not. I really struggle with it. You know, God doesn't care. What God wants us to know is that he loves us and he wants us to be honest with him. Honest about him and honest about ourselves. God, you are holy. Father, you are holy. And I'm not. And there's nothing I can do about it. You know, Jack said there's two ways we can approach God in prayer. We can take the business approach, the transactional approach. I'm going to do something for you, God, and then you do it for me. Or we can take the familial approach. You are my Father. I am your child. I come before you humbly, knowing that you're holy and I'm not. God, what will you do for me as your child? You know, Jack drew on that picture of Hosea. And if you've never read it before, I urge you to read it. It's a fantastic story. I'm one of those people, when I read a story, I like to turn to the last couple of pages and see how it ends. <laughs> And you know, the picture of Hosea is a picture of us when God does good stuff for us and we still turn our back on God and go our own direction. But you know, this is what we read at the end of Hosea. Return, O Lord, to the God, Lord your God. Your sins have been your downfall. Take words with you and return to the Lord. Say to him, forgive all our sins that we may offer the fruit of our lips. We will never again say our gods to what our own hands have made, for in you the fatherless find compassion. And I wonder if that's you this morning, if you have been searching for that one in your life who will make sense. Rediscover this morning, what God said to Israel through Hosea, in you, the fatherless, find compassion. Maybe you are the broken pot that Tori was referring to. And actually, it's only in being broken that we can discover the treasure that lies within Let's bow our heads and pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that we can come before you and say just that. Abba, Father. We thank you that we can come before you as children. 
Not people who can buy our way into your presence, who can do stuff to gain your approval. We can come before you as broken people, as fallen people, as wayward people, as selfish people, and say, I've made a mess of things. You are holy and I am not. And we thank you that because of what Jesus did for us on the cross, we can come before you and say, Abba, Father, and know that in you we will find compassion and fulfillment and purpose and meaning and light and mercy and grace. And Father, to the one this morning who is feeling beyond anything else, broken and shattered, would you help them to come before you and say afresh, or maybe for the first time, Abba, Father, Daddy, reveal the treasure within. Help me discover your purpose for my life. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Kate, did you want to say something about music for Daisy? Good morning, everyone. Um, just a quick reminder that in two weeks' time we'll be holding a concert here on the 27th of April. Um, doors open at 6.45, concert starts at 7.30. Um, music for Daisy, which is in memory of my daughter um, and is raising funds for Julia's house. So myself, my mum and my stepsister will be going to Jordan in November to trek. Um, we've just actually found out um, that on the final day, we'll be tre we will be going to the mount where Moses saw the promised land, which is amazing. So, um, and we're very blessed that already we've sold 82 seats for the evening. So I've got tickets with me today. If anyone's interested, they're £10. Um, should be a fantastic event. And thank you to the church for letting us host it here. So thank you very much. What, Julia's house is? Julia's house is a children's hospice based in Wimborne who looked after our daughter um, for the time that she was with us and also still look after us now. So we have a nurse who um, is dedicated to us still for... A number of years um, and so we get we get support through them and they offer sibling support as well so they're fantastic in fact she's going to be here hopefully on the night um, to talk a little bit about Julia's house as well so yeah should be good and thank you to everyone who's already joining us for that and helping lots of volunteers so thank you thank you Katie our service is finished please stay and have a cup of tea cup of coffee have a chat we'd love to get to know you if something Jack has talked about this morning or spoken to you please do come and talk to one of us we would love to pray through things with you and have a chat with you bless you thank you have a great week mm -hmm.